thank you so much for coming on. Man, just looking at your resume and everything you've done leading up to leading and being the CEO of Spire is incredible. You have done a number of incredible things. I wonder maybe we start this interview with how did you get to become the CEO of Spire? And you even co-founded the company. So how did your career leading up to prior to Spire lead to this? That's a that's a great question. And thanks, thanks, thanks for having me on and having this conversation with me. So I have been um and armored and inspired by space and how we could leverage space to uh, improve life on earth improve the you know the human condition and and what life is about ever since being a teenager but it was an industry and an area that really did not have room for someone dynamic you know i've been building stuff ever since being a teenager be that software be that hardware be that you know businesses uh, it just was not this type of place. And so I kept on looking at it, you know, I was there every 10, 15 years. And at one point, I went through a process. Um, I read a book by, by Laurie Beth Jones called The Path, where she takes you through a process of writing a mission statement for your life. Now, that's a mission statement for your life, not for your career or for your personal. No, it's for your life. And that mission statement came out uh, to lead, inspire, and create the business of space for the benefit of all. And it was a fascinating process because I, I read it and it resonated with me. And I said, like, hmm, okay, I did not expect this when I started the process. And clearly, that's not what I'm doing at this point in time. And I looked again, like, okay, how can I do something with space to improve the human condition life on earth. And it was still not a good place. And it took another decade, a bit, you know, 11 years of the world changing and certain pieces falling into place in the macroeconomic environment, the technologies that drive the industry, um, uh, certain uh, benefits that humanity can derive from space, you know, like climate change, uh, really coming to the forefront of the collective psyche of the zeitgeist that that allowed me to say, okay, let me quit my well-paying job, go back being a student, living in the dorm, you know, living hand to mouth as you do as a student, and study everything there is about space, and then apply myself on leveraging space to improve life on Earth. So, can you talk more about? writing your own mission statement for your life. That sounds fascinating. You said the book is called The Path. Um, so listeners and people who are watching this um, should check that out. But what was that process? How long did it take you to write your mission yeah. statement? It is, it, I would say it's about a, a six to eight week process because it is built upon a lot of self-reflection. Like one of the first exercises is, okay, there are four big elements, you know, in some traditions it's five, but, you know, four, you know, you have fire, you have water, you have earth, you have wind or air. Um, who are you? Right. And you start off by saying, OK, take earth and then write down 20 uh, features of earth, you know, uh, characteristics. And then, you know, write down 20 activities that really exemplify for you the element Earth. And you do this for Earth, you do it for all four elements. And then it's asked, like, who are you? Like, what kind of mixture are you? Are you really one element? And so you spend this time feeling, you know, am I more Earth? Am I more fire? You know, where, where, where am I? Um, and there are a lot of exercises like this, you know, like another exercise is, okay, what are some gifts that you have gone give uh, you have been given from the people you grew up with, from your siblings, your parents, your grandparents, your teachers, your neighbors. Um, what have they given you as a gift? Which gifts have you accepted, and which gifts did you not accept? What kind of expectations did they place on top of you, and which one did you make your own? Which one did you? accept and put it in your backpack, but you you fulfill them, but they're not really yours. And which one did you kind of like ignore? 
And so you really go through like this period of self-reflection and different from a math problem, which you can cram and you can just like, okay, I'm just going to get it done, right? Um, When you do like this self-reflection of who you are, you need to give it time to breathe. You need to give it um, space to expand and come to the surface. And so that's why the process takes a little bit of time um, as you as you spend time with yourself and what makes you you and really drives you. And then you uh, identify your values um, and you really hone and you start with like this massive list of activities and you really hone into like what resonates with me. Um, and so that's just like, it just takes time and space that you need to allow for this. You can't just like do it, you know, oh, I just do it five minutes, you know, over lunch, you know, in between, you know, my, my two big phone calls. It needs space, um, but it's a it's a wonderful process. It's one that 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 I absolutely love. I have um, I have uh, uh, augmented the process since then with other kind of things and put it together in like a, a nice little program for people um, uh, because I think it's a very powerful exercise to have a sentence as simple as to lead, inspire, and create the business of space for the benefit of all to help you just check in, you know, how much of my life is following this sentence right now? And it's going to be okay. You know, sometimes it's going to be zero. And you, as long as you can understand why you're choosing to only have 0% of your life being in tune with that mission statement, that's okay. You know, there was a long time coming for me. The time was simply not right to be in the space industry. You know, you have like this thing called bills to pay, right? And um, uh, <laughs> the time was just just wasn't right. And and I was always though ready and on the lookout and willing to sacrifice. You know, I went from a from a nice job in in finance to being a student, having no money. You know, I actually had to sell to sell some of my calc. I have a I have a, I have a, I have a old calculator collection. I had to just sell some pieces of my calculator collection to pay for food, right, and rent. So. Um, I think it was totally worthwhile, and it's certainly something that I I can highly recommend for people. What what drove your decision to go back to school? That's interesting. So so part of part of it is like I really like I really like university. I like studying. You know, I like you know um, uh, learning new stuff. So that's I think it's part of me, right? So you don't you don't accumulate three graduate degrees if you don't like university, right? So right. part of it is just simply I just like it, right? Um, I I really wanted to have a strong foundation. You know, like I had had a business education and I had a physics education. And that's probably a reasonable start, but I've never worked in the space industry. And so I looked for a a highly compressed um, uh, master's program that allowed me to learn everything from space engineering to the census, to the applications, to the law, to the policies, to the big players. I wanted to like have a 360 degree view of what is happening in the space industry. And I knew that there were programs we could give me that. And so I looked at all of the programs across the world. And then there is one in uh, in France, in, in, in Strasbourg, which could give me that. And I, you know, I learned everything from like, you know, the Outer Space Treaty of 1968 and, you know, the space policies differences between India and the United States and China and Russia to, you know, quaternions and, uh, uh, and and space engineering and, and, you know, how SAR works and how optics works and how everything else in between works in that program. Um, and on top of that, got to spend time at NASA as an intern as well. So it was a 100% worthwhile experience that gave me uh, what I was looking for, this 360 view of the state of the space industry at that point in time. And then, like, when you get to Spire, you, you've written your personal mission statement. And now you get to a point where you got to write your company's mission statement and come up with your company's values. What was the difference between that process from personal and, and company? And how long did that take? And how did you come up with your company's values and mission statement? So I think the easy thing is, you know, when you start a company, you get to, like, overlap you know, the, the mission statement of your, of your own and the company, you know, pretty closely. And so for, for Spire, it is to, to leverage space to improve life on Earth. Uh, so there is an almost 100% overlap. 
um, you have to spend a lot of time on, well, how do I then do this as a business, right? So you do have to spend a lot of time on where is the market opportunity? Why is there a business? Why will there be an opportunity to spend X dollars to create X plus Y dollars of value so that you can get you know, a small percentage of the value that you create from your customers? So that's where you spend a lot of time. But what we wanted to do, what I wanted to do, that, that was very easy. Like I wanted to leverage space to improve life on Earth. And clearly it had to be around data. You know, I've been around data and love data since I'm a little kid. And so that was, I think, I think that was that was pretty straightforward. I think where we spend more time on that is like, okay, so that's the mission, improve life uh, on Earth through space, you know, leverage space to do that as a data company. Okay, how do we want this place to feel like? You know, I was fortunate that I had been part of a lot of very high performing organizations. CERN, the Boston Consulting Group, Harvard, you know, hedge funds on Wall Street. So I've, I've been around, um, uh, fortunately, a, a lot of high performing organizations, right? And then you say, like, okay, what is like the stuff again like, that makes really me, me? Because those are going to be the easiest people for me to attract, right? And there are certain things where data tells you what you know makes great performing organizations. So one of them is okay, the greater the variety of backgrounds, you know, the higher performing the team, right? You know, you stick, um, uh, you know, they did like this this famous experiment in in, in the military where they said, okay, you need to find a, a submarine or something like that, and they stuck, you know. One group was like 10 submarine engineers or something like that. And the other one was like 10 random people. And the 10 random people from their background, I mean, they were all like really, really smart, really, really good. But you had like historians and other people in the random group. They outperformed, you know, nine out of 10 times the specialists, right? So diversity of experience, you know, different approaches, education, mindsets, preferences, all of that. Um, uh, And that MIT study kind of like measured it, like they outperform, right? So very quickly, we said, okay, we want to be, was a little bit too difficult, formulated, the world's largest heterogeneous group of superstars. Um, uh, I think I think the marketing people of the U.S. later called it, you want to have diverse people. It's much easier to remember. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, so there are certain things that um, uh, you have just data for why you want to do it. You want to have growth mindset. You know, growth mindset people, they deal well with changing circumstances, right? If the environment in which you operate is dynamic, that is much preferred. Um, there were a couple of pieces in my in my thesis work on, of, of, uh, in France. One of them was that I discovered or described the equivalent of Moore's law from the computer industry operating in the space industry. But the other one was a juxtaposition of the this, a static um, a description of the business environment according to Porter's five forces, where everyone has a role. Right? You know, you are my vendor. I am, you know, Mary's competitor, right? So it's very static versus um, uh, Richter's um, uh, dynamic business ecosystem approach, which looks more of like how actually biology, um, flora and fauna are organized, where, you know, let's take a pack of wolves, which is an example that is often used. They are fierce competitors for ranking inside the pack. But when they hunt, they are fierce and loyal collaborators, right? And so, so roles are very dynamic in the, in the um, uh, ecosystem around the world. And the same thing happened when your business environment is rapidly changing, um, as for example, it was in the space industry, that companies were sometimes vendors, sometimes they were you know, prime, sometimes they were collaborators, sometimes they were competitors. And it's just a different view on the world. And like, having a, a more dynamic view is very, very beneficial. So there are certain things which are um, you have data for, but then there are certain things which are preference. So we built our six values alongside things which we believed are either preference or there's data for it. So for example, um, one of our six values is collaborative. Now, um, we all are aware of organizations that are extremely high achieving, but it's not very collaborative. It's like you eat what you kill, including your colleague, right? Um, and, and, and it works, 
right? You know, I worked in an organization where it's kind of like, well, if you don't get promoted in 18 months, we fire you. And promotion is like, it's not there's unlimited amounts of promotion available, right? And they say, oh, well, you can have a limit you. But, you know, end of the day, you know, they're not going to promote everyone to be the boss, right? Um, so different organizations are, are successful based on different premises. And we just made a choice based on preference to be collaborative, to say winning Inspire is a team sport. What matters is that we win and winning is, is that you deliver or over deliver to the customer. Um, and it doesn't really matter that who individually was like, we're all going to share this, right? Um, uh, and we consider the collaborative effort, right? And so that's one of our values. And we enshrined that, you know, we, uh, we sat down, we did like a seminar, we had someone guide us and it was a three day process. Um, where again, you, you went through like the, the words and, and the, and the feelings and the, and the pictures. And then we came out with our, with our six values. And, and, and to this day, they, um, they guide us. We interview by them. We call it out in individuals' performances. Um, uh, uh, when we, when we give kudos to people, it is for one of those values. So there really are something lived inside the company. Um, uh, and not something just on the webpage. I'm sure those listening or watching want to know the other five values. Uh, if, if you don't mind, could you, could you walk through those and how they, uh, you know, have benefited your company and kind of the, I mean, the same way you went through like being collaborative, I think that would be really useful to understand like how, cause you coming up with six values, putting that much time into it is, is very interesting. So the, the, um, the first one, in some instances, we called, we called it like the primus inter pares, is global. Now, global has many, many layers, right? The first layer is, is like, well, we have satellites, and they, they circle around the Earth. And so by definition, that is global. The beauty of leveraging space to improve life on Earth is that the data that you collect is immediately globally relevant. So our sales from day one were quite international. We have, you know, today, you know, 65 out of the 192 countries are, you know, um, has customers of Spire, even though we're still a pretty small, small company at just, you know, 100 plus million of revenue. Um, uh, so that's kind of like from our operations. The satellites are everywhere. And uh, very early on, I hired uh, someone to be in charge of satellite operations. And he said, Peter, um, I want you to promise me that you're not going to do shift work for satellite operations. Most other companies at that point in time, and still today, they have like one big satellite operation centers in one country, and then they do eight hour shift work. And that means there is like some group of people that always has to work the graveyard shift from like 10 to 6. 66%, something like that was the number that uh, the chef uh, accorded me, of errors happen in the graveyard shift. I mean, who wants to work their whole life from 10 p.m. at night to 6 a.m. in the morning? Um, and so that was one of the reasons why we said, okay, we're going to set ourselves up globally with offices eight hours time zone apart so that we have natural um, uh, coverage. Once in a while, people still have to do shift work, but generally, you know, we don't because we have this eight-hour set, right? So that's that's kind of like global. Then um, we wanted to uh, reach global customers, so you want to be, you know, local there as another element of global. Our customers are global. We wanted to tap into the global labor market, so that having different locations allowed us to hire people um, from across the world. We have. Um, uh, I think a larger number of, uh, of countries represented by our people than we have customers in. Um, so that all of that is an element of global, but global is also the way we think about it in, in uh, the representation of thoughts and cultures and backgrounds and experiences and ages um, in our teams. Um, I don't know what the age range today is, but I know that at some point it was literally from like 14 to 90 um, in, 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 in our population, right? Um, uh, we, ha we have had teams of like 10 people that represented nine different countries and cultures, right? Um, so, so this, this, this um, global nature of the team, the uh, heterogeneity of superstars or diversity um, as they say, is another layer of global for us. So global really has a number of those layers. And that's why we sometimes call it, you know, like the primus inter pares, because it talks about the setup and the relevance 
we didn't want to build a product that helps, you know, rich, I don't know, Californians. Um, we wanted to build something that is relevant for, for 8 billion people in 192 countries. And that is, was like the aspiration and is continues to today to be the aspiration that what we do is relevant all across the world and not just in a, in a, in a small segment. Um, so that's global. Uh, then there is like a, a pretty easy one, you know, reliable. Um, Reliable pretty much means is that says like, I'm going to do what I say that I'm going to do. Right. And if I don't, I, you know, it's just, I'm not just going to say, well, you know, oh, well, but be, um, uh, be very, very, um, uh, you know, uh, beaten down and, and apologetic about it and really work hard to, to, to relinquish this. And reliable is not just, um, to our, you know, our customers. It's to all stakeholders, right? Which means, you know, there's customers, there are investors, there are colleagues, there are, you know, our suppliers, our vendors. It's um, the people that internally of the company, we deliver something to, right? So it's just this generally like, um, if you say you're going to do something, you really feel morally bound to doing what you said that you're going to do. You know, give you an example. Um, being European, you know, I think that companies should make money, right? And so um, uh, over two years ago, um, we talked out, it's like, okay, we want to be profitable um, by a certain point in time, which was, you know, um, uh, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a few quarters from now. Um, and guess what? Next month after we said this, um, there was a war in, in Europe. Russia invaded Ukraine. And then we had like interest rates go going through the roof. And then we had inflation exploding. And then we had, you know, the big resignation of people, right? And then we had um, uh, uh, recession warnings, right? And we kind of like for the last two years, like all these things have happened. So we've gone from a world up and to the right, you know, money is free and everything is perfect to like a really, really difficult period. Now, Spire has not changed its timeline for when we say we got to be profitable, right? It's just like um, uh, it's just like the commitment to like you know I, we if we say something we gotta move literally heaven and earth to be reliable, um, which then brings us to like the next value is like okay um, what kind of things can you lean on to be be reliable like one of them is our value of being relentless, um, and, and you know the picture for um, for relentless is. Uh, a, a deep gorge with water. And the image behind it is like water is relentless. It just keeps on grinding. And if you do it for long enough, water will cut through rock and granite a deep gorge because it is relentless. Um, relentless lives also in one of our sayings of like everything is an iteration. This concept, uh, concept of, of Kaizen or continuous improvement, um, which is like, you know, um, you do something um, and you assess it and you get data and then you improve it. You are just relentless in like getting better. You don't get bogged down by waiting until it's perfect and then you do something. No, you, you do something um, uh, and then you iterate from it. But you kind of like, you just stick with it relentlessly. You just build upon it. Um, there's this uh, this great book, uh, Atomic Habits, which talked about stacking of habits, where you where you do something, you do a little bit, and then you do it on top of it, and you have like this compounding effect of just doing things, you know, on top of each other um, uh, on a um, uh, uh, on a regular basis. Um, so that's uh, uh, that's relentless. Then uh, there is a recognition that there is only one irrecoverable resource in the universe. And that is time. Once you have spent time, it is irrecoverable. You can make money again if you spend it on something. You can get your leg in the cast and you know do physical therapy. You know if you if if you broke um, uh, a leg, you can apologize to your friend if you if you pissed her off um, and mend the relationship. But once you have spent time. It is irrecoverable. 
As a physicist, it's the only thing which has a clear direction. And unfortunately, um, the world is getting faster. Rate of change is increasing. Um, it is already a rate of change, which means it's exponential, but even the rate of the rate of change is increasing. And so, so one of our values is faster, which just recognizes um, the value of time and a, um, a, a preference for action uh, and for driving things. And if it can be done today, then let's do it today on, and start in the morning and maybe not wait until the evening. Um, so that, uh, that faster is, is a recognition, as uncomfortable as it is, um, uh, of, uh, of, of our values. So we have global, reliable, relentless, um, uh, faster, uh, and, uh, uh, and, and, and collaborative. Now, now I want to get to your mission statement, and that is to leverage space to improve life on Earth. I wonder how can space be leveraged to improve life on Earth using data, which would go, that's another way of saying, what does Spire do? So, you know, it's actually two questions, to be honest, right? Because space, um, uh, I mean, there's a, there's a large number of satellites that everyone um, of our listeners is using today to do their lives, right? If you, if you paid with a credit card, you use space, right? If you um, looked up where a restaurant is, you use space. So um, we use space, every single one of us, every single day in many, many ways. Um, for Spy in particular, uh, there are like two elements that really drive us that are like what we want to impact. And one of them is climate change. And the other one is global security. Um, we had this, um, this hypothesis, this prediction, um, not just what satellite capabilities will be, you know, by um, 2015, 2020, 2025, but also that climate change is going to become a, a theme uh, a, a threat, a challenge, an opportunity for humanity that is more and more top of mind as years go by. And the other one being global security is, is going to be more and more important in a lot of ways, some of which are intertwined with, uh, 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 with climate change. And there's a, just a, a recognition that you cannot tackle either one of those two without space, or let's put it this way, um, you can tackle them orders of magnitude more effectively by leveraging space. So if we're talking about climate change, a um, couple simple examples. Um, one of them is, is, is weather prediction. Um, Spire collects data that allows more accurate weather prediction of like where a hurricane will land and how much it's going to rain and, 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 and how much wind is going to blow there. And and, and thanks to our efforts and selling this data and making it available to other organizations, there's about a billion people today that have more accurate weather prediction because of our effort. We like to make it 8 billion and we like to make it even more big, big impact. But for a young company, I would say it's a, it's a solid start, right? Um, we help companies reduce uh, their carbon emissions by using less fuel which then means you know, they have a better bottom line because they make more money because they spent less money on fuel. Um, so those are kind of like just, uh, just some high level examples um, uh, on, on, on the climate change side. And then on the, on the global security side, you know, um, where is my ship? Is it close to pirates? Is someone smuggling something? Is someone you know, making flying impossible or dangerous because the GPS doesn't work anymore? Um, is someone, you know, maybe up to some nefarious activities and I can identify where they are trying to do it from, even in the darkest of night and under, you know, deep cloud and, uh, and foliage coverage. Uh, that's some of the, some of the products that, that we, uh, offer to the world, um, to, to try to make it, uh, a, a more, um, you know, a more fair and a more balanced place. They say transparency is the best disinfectant. You know, when you when you shine a light into dark corners, all sorts of scurry animals start to like, you know, run away. And if you have uh, um, a large satellite constellation, we cover the Earth um, uh, uh, over 100 times a day. There's a lot of light that we try to shine in all places of the Earth, you know, hoping to bring to bring more transparency and, and openness to it. 
Speaking of nefarious acts, I mean, this could be screwed up. Space could also be used for bad, right? And there was a recent story just a few days ago about Russia wanting to launch nukes into space. I don't necessarily want you to comment on that specific story, but how do you prevent space from being used for bad? So um, I once said you can use a knife to slice tomatoes or you can slice something else, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, and it's indeed, it is very, very hard to prevent that some people will use just about anything to, to do harm to, to others and the world. I do think that, that space has a bit of a, of a special place because yes, you know, we love the ocean and we love clean water, but I don't think there's anything that has inspired humans for thousands of years as much as space. All of us at some point have looked up in the dark of night and seen the stars and wondered about the universe. There is something truly magical about space that inspires us all, that I think increases our willingness to, no, no, we got to protect that. We want it, this is a special place. So I think that is like, that's like a big benefit there, right? Um, I think another benefit is that, um, you know, I, I, think, I think people have done pretty mean things on the oceans. Mm -hmm. And do we really get that big of an article about it? Yeah. It has to be something real, the fact that it's not potentially happening, but it is happening. But if someone, you know, potentially does something bad in space, everyone reads about it. Like, because it's like so emotionally connected to people. It's like, now, hey, you know, this is my space, right? And, you know, the, um, uh, the governments of the world, they, they want to use space. They want to use space for observing their land. They want to use space for their spy satellites, right? Um, so I think space really has a, has a special place, I would say. You know, I always think um, uh, from an inspirational perspective on how the foundational law that still today um, uh, drives how space operation happens on an international level was done. It's the Outer Space Treaty from 1968. Now, if we think back what happened in 1968, um, it was a tight period. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think there were like drills for kids in the U.S. in schools um, for nuclear war. It was a very, very tense period. But despite that tension and the tenseness, the United States and the USSR came together and wrote and ratified together the foundational law that um, uh, uh, governs how we use space. I mean, we have to think about that. I mean, they were in the Cold War and still they came together to protect space, which starts off with a statement, Space is for everyone, and everyone has an equal right to use space. I mean, that's kind of like the, the, one of the first foundational statements there, mm -hmm. right? When you think about the International Space Station, where the United States and Russia have been part for many, many decades, there is something very special about space. And I think there are more people in more countries overall working together, even in the most difficult circumstances to protect it for future generation and to protect it for today's generations. Now, in all fairness, um, uh, you know, caveat emptor, I'm the guy who left a good job at 42 and live in a dorm and start a space company, right? So if I'm, you know, I have to be a little bit crazy and I definitely have to be an optimist. So um, uh, that definitely shines through, but still just think the last time you walked outside and looked at the stars, and you felt more special because there is something unique about space. So I'm guessing you don't think we faked the moon landing. Uh, no, I do not. <laughs> uh, as you, as you've orbit, so how often do you orbit the earth every day? So we have um, uh, actually over a hundred spacecraft and they cover every spot on earth every 15 minutes. So in the time since you and I have been talking, both you and I have been covered by, by one of our spacecraft about three, four times. 
And have you had any like interesting encounters? I'm not necessarily talking about UFOs or anything, but like, it, is it crowded up there? How does all this, how do these satellites not crash into each other? Okay, so I want you to, uh, I want you to follow me along on like an, uh, a visualization that tries, at least I try to share how vast space really is. Mm -hmm. So we track all of the world's uh, ships, in particular, all of like the massive ships, right? And we've all seen like um, uh, I once was in uh, I was on vacation on, in, on the Thompson River um, uh, in the Thousand Islands in like the north of uh, of New York State on the border to Canada. And on the Thompson River, they have like these massive ships come by, right? And it's just like you stand there and you just look up like this, and it's just they're absolutely massive, right? And there are, you know, we track about five. Hundred thousand of them um, uh, on, on the oceans. Right now, you know the oceans are about call it seventy percent of the Earth. So, roughly speaking, you have like almost half the space if you wanted to have all of the Earth. Let's imagine all of the Earth being oceans. So instead of five hundred thousand, we could do I don't know seven hundred fifty thousand. I'll call it seven hundred thousand. Right. Um, and then the neat thing about space is that you don't just have one shell, right? You can make a shell every 10 miles or so, right? So let's say space goes from like 500, like the low Earth orbit space goes from, let's say, 500 kilometers to like 1,000 kilometers. So we could make, I don't know, another 50 shells. So you can take, you know, 700,000 times 50, right? So you're talking about a few million massive ships, now, the spacecraft that Spire has, they're not a massive ship. They are the size of a bottle of wine. As a matter of fact, there is no spacecraft in orbit the size of a massive ship. They are all much, much smaller. The really big ones are the size of a, of, of a bus, right? A small bus, right? Not like a big bus, a small bus, mm -hmm. right? Um, so millions of things the size of massive, massive ships and in reality, we have a few thousand operate. So that's like three, four orders of magnitude difference. There is some simplification in that picture. But still, space is absolutely massive. Even on Earth, 95% um, of the world's population lives on 5% of the world's surface area. Right. So when we think about Earth, we basically think, you know what? I visited your house and you showed me the guest bathroom on the entrance. And that's all that I saw. And I'm going to talk about your house by describing that guest bathroom, uh, bathroom of the house. Like, wow, he has a fantastic, you know, like, you know, it's like white there and there's some water and like, oh, my God, the richness. I'm just describing the guest bathroom. Even Earth is massive. Space is like massive squared. I wonder what does a typical day look like for you? How do you how do you decide how to spend your time, where to spend your time, where to focus? Um, so you have you have like an, an overarching distribution of uh, of duties in in a, in a company, right? And so for me, it is a lot about engaging with uh, uh, with investors. Um, it is uh, uh, engaging with the people in the company and communicating to them. Um, and uh, uh, and it is you know on the technology side you know that's that's kind of like a, a little bit where 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 my focus is. So I can so you got like this this three big areas um, uh, of engagement, and then you allocate your time roughly alongside you know those three things. And then there's periods where you spend more time with investors, and there's periods where you spend more time with the people. Um, but overall, you try to like balance this out and make sure that. Overall, across like the executive team, all the areas are, 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 are well covered, right? And then you have to add to that, okay, you know, then um, I have myself, right? So I, I, I dedicate a certain amount of time to sports and meditation and, and health. Um, and, then, and then you have your, your family um, uh, and, and, uh, and friends, right? And so you, um, uh, you allocate your time to that wholeness. And it, you know, it's, it squishes here and there, but you, uh, at, at least it is for myself, you do keep track. You got like a, a, a mental running in the background that it sees like, okay, 
am I am I like you know over value over investing here right now? Do I need to change that over time? Um, so that you you have all of like those various elements um, uh, well covered, and you always look for um, you know we, we do we do this this quarterly career progression discussions and 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 the and the first few couple of questions is like what are the activities that you enjoyed the most in the last quarter, and how can we help you do more of them, and what are the activities that you enjoyed the least in the last quarter. And how can we help you do less of them, right? Um, now, no one is having this conversation with me, so I have to do it with myself. But you <laughs> think about it, like, okay, what are the stuff that I really enjoy? Because you, if you enjoy something, you're going to be better at it in the long run. You're going to have the energy to get through the difficult periods of time. And, and can you shift what you do a little bit to spend more time with your strengths um, uh, uh, rather than with things that are just like a little bit of a, of a drag for you? Speaking of the things that would be a drag, I wonder, like, has artificial intelligence helped in that area? Like things that, you know, are kind of tedious and things. And how has the rise of artificial intelligence um, affected Spire? So, I mean, uh, do you have another couple hours? Um, yeah. uh, of course, to talk about this. Um, so I think, I think the short answer is like, yes, you know, um, artificial intelligence has been beneficial. Um, uh, 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 from a you know customer engagement on the writing side, you know like um, from a marketing engagement in in creating impactful campaigns, um, so there's a there's a whole host of areas there. Um, I think overall, um, artificial intelligence is is great for a company like Spire, right? So when you think about it, um, before artificial intelligence. There was a, a big premium on you having um, uh, either a big brain or a very, very big computer, right? So that kind of like was was like the, the big value. Like, you know, you are, you know, hyper smart and, you know, you have massive compute resources, right? I think what artificial intelligence is, like, it just removes this, you know what? Um, it's not about the compute resources that you have. It's about, do you have unique data, right? So do you have unique data that I would call just stuff, for example, that we collect, that you can only collect from space or um, creative ideas, which is what humans have as unique data. So artificial intelligence is moving the power from large compute to you know, large, uh, large amounts of data, from supercomputers to super data providers. And that that is great for a company like Spire. You know, we have data that literally no one else in the world has, um, and we produce more of it every single day. So every single day, we add to our competitive advantage. And then AI and machine learning allows us and our customers to extract more value from that unique data, um, requiring less uh, compute resources. So it democratizes the value extraction from data, which means at the end of the day, more customers. Uh, I could talk to you forever. My goodness. And we should have you back on because uh, your knowledge and everything you're going through right now is just so fascinating. But I want to be respectful of your time. And at CEO.com, we end every interview with the exact same question because we believe the chances one gives just as important as the chances one takes. I wonder when you hear that, who gave you a chance to get you to where you are today? Um, so when when we started the company and we talked, you know, again, you got a picture of this. This is like it was like 2012. Um, we are in San Francisco, the sun is shining, and we talk with people about the weather. Right? That was a tough conversation to have. It's like why, why do I need weather prediction? You know, like weather is always 72 degrees and sunny. You know, like this is just, this is just stupid, right? Um, and then, you know, people are like, oh, and I, and I talk to my friends at NASA and they say, what you say you're going to do is like breaking the laws of physics. And this is like, yes, today, but there's an exponential improvement, um, which is really, really hard for, for people to comprehend. So um, it was not an easy story, but there was an individual that took the time and that listened um, uh, and he, Will Poitiers, has been a steadfast supporter um, of the company, of our mission, of myself, 
now for, for pretty much a decade. Um, and, and it certainly wasn't always easy for him um, because guess what? We missed some deadlines that wasn't like our plan that we had, you know, 10 years ago um, because rockets, you know, they sometimes are delayed and stuff like that happens. Um, but, uh, but it has been fantastic to have his support. And so he certainly is a, is a huge reason that you and I have a conversation because without him, you probably wouldn't be interested in me at all. Peter, thank you so much for joining us. Seriously, come back on. Uh, we, we could talk for a whole nother hour about AI and all sorts of things that, that you're working on. So appreciate you coming on. Uh, thank you for taking the time. It would be my pleasure. Thanks for having me.